Well, Minister uh, Nikita Davis said that she was taking it back to 2011. I'm taking it all the way back to 1982. <laughs> okay? All right, we got people clapping with that. Yeah. I want you to know that God definitely has you. If you don't get anything else out of what I say tonight or what you hear tonight, is he has you. He is your bridegroom. You are his beloved, and he loves you. He loves you. I think I've got a slide. 1982 was my senior prom. All right, that was, a, you know, it was such a special time. You know, as a girl or even a guy, it's kind of a rite of passage, right? You're going to go to your senior prom. You see, I've got those big fashion forward eyeglasses, <laughs> delicately balanced by that blue little flower in my afro, right? You have to have the balance. You can't have too big, right? With that smile. You know, I had on this blue dress, and it was such an important time to me. This was actually my first date. And so I was just so happy that someone actually wanted to take me out and then take me to the prom. I was looking forward to the, uh, you know, the whole preparation, getting dressed, right, putting the dress on, uh, going out to the dance. But all of this happened kind of on the backdrop of darkness. I was in this little bathroom at my parents' home, right, and uh, we had a lot of issues in our home. My father was a Vietnam vet. He still is. Right now, he has multiple myeloma. He's dying right now. He's hanging in there, though, right? He's hanging in there. Um, but during that time, he had PTSD. So there were nights when we would go to sleep, and he would wander the halls kind of screaming out. So imagine my first date. I'm trying to get dressed. My mother's squirting me with perfume. Never really wore makeup. And I wanted it to be the special time. But because of my father and his mood at that day, we were confined to this little bathroom. And it really was this cloud over me. And it was really a painful, painful time for me. I felt so disregarded, so ignored. Why can't I have this for me? Just this one time. Just this one time. In 1985... I went to work as a nurse, a registered nurse at the time. I think we've got another slide. And <laughs> you see the angelic host um, cap? That's when nurses wore caps. No one in here probably recognizes that nurses actually did wear caps, right? Anyways, I, um, I went to work as a nurse in an intensive care, cardiothoracic intensive care unit in Memphis, Tennessee. I was one of the first black nurses to work in this unit. Uh, and what was interesting about that uh, was that uh, as a nurse in this particular unit, in order to get your patient assignment, you had to stand in the center hall, and there was this big whiteboard, and you would wait for the charge nurse to come and actually assign you the patient. Well, being the only African American there, I'm standing at this board surrounded by white nurses. And it was the year that Martin Luther King's uh, holiday was going to uh, uh, be enacted, basically. It was signed into office, just a little backdrop. It was signed into office in 1983 by Ronald Reagan, and they, in Tennessee, had not enacted it at that time. And remember, Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm standing in the middle of these nurses, and they are talking about why he didn't deserve to have the holiday. And they're discussing that right in front of me. Right in front of me. And the only thing I knew how to do was make like a tree. I knew how to play the game. I knew what it meant to be ignored. I had felt it in my own home. So those prongs of racism and unkind words were words that definitely impacted me. They definitely caused me a lot of pain and, and, and despair. But I had to keep quiet. I didn't have the words or the worth to speak up. It was not a good time. 
It was not a good time. I started to think about, was that another slide? I started to think about when did I start feeling unseen? When did I start feeling unseen? When did I struggle with being insecure or having these feelings of being disregarded? And I realized they started when I was pretty young. My father was a military man, so we traveled, right? Traveled all over the country. I was in Anchorage, Alaska, El Paso, Texas, Dallas, Texas. We were all over the place. And every time I went somewhere, I had to try to reinvent the wheel. It was easier to step back and not say anything. And if I could find a friend, awesome. Most of the time, I couldn't. And so I was always on guard. And I always, it was easier. I was definitely lonely and alone at the same time. But it just was easier. So I just kind of shrank back. I didn't have a voice. It was easy to be invisible. Have you ever felt invisible? Have you ever felt invisible? It feels like it's easier, but it just kind of eats at your soul. One of the things that happened during this time for me was that, fortunately, there were other invisible people that wanted to be my friend. <laughs> the girl that had the fire red hair, she wanted to be my friend. The guy that realized when we were in middle school that he was gay, right? He came out to me. He was my friend. The folks that were socially awkward, kind of the nerdy people, they were my friends. People that didn't have any money, right? They weren't connected. They were my friends. But God is good. He's got us. He's good. He's got us. In Genesis 16, Hagar was in a predicament. Hagar was the slave, the maidservant for Sarah, the mistress. She was married to Abraham. Sarah and Abraham were married, but they could not produce an heir, right? And so Sarah gets this great idea, let's get Hagar to give us an heir. Hagar, who's a slave, all of a sudden has the opportunity to be front stage and center. Sarah asked her to lay with her husband. Hagar did. And guess what happened? She conceived. She conceived. Now, sounds like it's pretty cut and dry, right? Pretty cut and dry. Mm -mm. Not so much. Baby mama drama. <laughs> Baby mama drama. Hagar started feeling herself. She was getting, you know what? I'm the one that gave Abram a child. What have you done? You're the one who told me to do this. And Sarah says, you need to go. Right? As any good woman would. You need to go. And so Hagar found herself out in the desert, crying. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord came to Hagar and said, Hagar, go back. The Lord has seen your misery. Name your son Ishmael. That's what Ishmael means. The Lord has seen your misery. And also know that he is a God who sees. He is a God who sees. And in that instant, Hagar moved from being a woman who was unseen, rejected, despised, mocked, to being seen. When I went to my prom, it was my opportunity to be seen. And it didn't work out that way for me. It didn't work out that way for me. When you think about your life, do you believe that God sees you? That he doesn't look past you like some people do? 
maybe those folks in your own family that look past you. They don't know things about you. You see, Jesus, he really understands that, right? Think about Jesus. Think about him. Jesus showed up on the scene. John the Baptist ushered him in. Jesus came in, and his heart was for Israel, but his own people turned their back on him, didn't they? They turned their back on him. He was so disregarded. The Pharisees mocked him. Eventually, they killed him. The Bible says they killed him out of envy. So you know they knew who he was. But they, they played the game. They ignored him. And Jesus, in that, realized and lamented in his heart that they refused to come to me to have life. They refused to come to me to have life. You know, there were some people that got it, though. Think about Zacchaeus. What does Zacchaeus do? He climbed a tree. He said, I'm a tax collector. I'm a tax collector, but I'm about to climb this tree. <laughs> I'm going to see Jesus. He got, he, and the Bible even says he was a short man. <laughs> I love the Lord. He'll just tell you everything. <laughs> he says, Zacchaeus, because he wants to make a point to you all. You know what? Zacchaeus was short, and he climbed that tree because he wanted to be seen by Jesus. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come out of that tree because I'm coming to your house tonight for dinner. What about the bleeding woman? The bleeding woman had been bleeding for years. The Bible tells us that she had been treated by so many physicians and none could heal her. She was ignored. She was a social pariah. But most of all, to the Jews, she was unclean. Right? And this woman says, I need to be seen. And I most certainly need to be healed. See, the bleeding was the worst part, right? It seems like the worst part, but even to be ostracized, that was even, imagine that. You're unclean. No one can touch you. No one can love you. But she said, if I could just touch him, if I could just see Jesus, if I could go and see him, I'll be seen and I will be healed. And so she goes and she reaches out. Now, the Bible tells us that he was surrounded by big crowds. But she reached out and she touched him. And he said, who touched me? Who touched me? And she was healed. She was seen. Even our Savior on the cross was ignored. He was mocked. And he cried out to the Lord, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? You see, when you think that people are looking past you and they're not paying attention to you, think about Jesus. Think about Jesus. He was on the cross and spit on and made fun of. Even God at this point, he was our sin, right? He had felt forsaken. You know, <laughs> we quote a lot of scriptures. You know, the Lord knows all the hairs on my head. The Lord knows all the hairs on my head. I don't know how he does it, but he knows them. The Lord knew me when I was knitted together in my mama's womb, <laughs> right? When I was at my mother's breast, the Lord saw me. He knew me. We can get all, 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 all religious about that, but I think there's a part of us that doesn't get that and doesn't believe it. You know why I say that? When I look at Sarah, um, first of all, let me just say this. It is about him and him alone. And we know it's about him and him alone because when we try to fight against that, when we get upset when people ignore us, 
and disregard us, we start getting insecure, right? And we start acting crazy. Who does she think she is? <laughs> right? Somebody resonated with that, huh? <laughs> Who does she think she is? Or we blow it off, or it doesn't matter. Or we go into victim mentality. We become a victim. But look what happened when Sarah said, I'm about to take care of this situation. God is not figuring this out enough, fast enough for me. She took it in her own hands, and she had Hagar lay with her own husband, right? I'm going to tell you why I'm talking about this. Recently, God is so good because he's always looking at our hearts. I was at a conference, and somebody walked right past me, and I actually reached out to the person. I actually touched them physically, and they just pushed past me. And I thought, hmm, is that? But I said, okay, whatever. <clears throat> and then I reached out again to them, and they pushed past me again. I started getting really weird. I was so weird that later that night, I was in my bed in the dark Googling, <clears throat> what does it feel like to be ignored? I mean, that's bad. My husband was snoring next to me. And I realized that God, you know what, he's all, his spirit is always circulating. He is always working on us. You know, my old scars, when I was at the prom, when I was in grade school, when I was in nursing, all of those old scars, those scars weren't healed. They weren't healed. They were scabbed over, and the Lord went in, and he wound back those scars. That's a good nursing term for nurses out there, right? He wound back those scars, right? And he understood that he needed to tunnel deep. He needed to tunnel deep because God, he's in the business of complete and total redemption and restoration. He's not playing around because you are his. He doesn't want you squirming in his arms. He wants to love on you, and he wants to receive you. Do you receive the love of the Lord daily? Do you allow him to love you daily? Or are you still thinking about who has done you wrong? In high school, my school librarian was my angel of the Lord. Hashtag, I love librarians. You know why? They notice the smallest details. Anybody a librarian in here? Too bad. <laughs> I love a librarian. You know, they are so detail-oriented, right? But my librarian came to me, and she said, Tamara, come over here. <laughs> and I was like, walking around, Momo. She says, come over here. What's going on? What's going on? And I told her. I told her what was going on. I didn't have the money to get some things I needed for my senior year. And she says, I've got you. I've got you. You know, Hagar was able to exclaim, I have seen the one who sees me. Jesus was able to say, I am in him, and he is in me, and he has me. And I am able to say that Jesus definitely has me, that he has me, and he loves me as his child. I want to show you the picture of my daughter going to her senior prom. That's Emma. And believe me, we made a really big deal about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>